Hello, everyone. Um, give it another minute or so, I guess, for people to come in. But uh, this evening's session will be on uh, trauma and orthopedics, um, questions around those topics, um, some things that seem to come up quite a few times in the exam. And then again, hopefully some more tips and tricks uh, for you guys to try to tackle the exam. Uh, if you've been coming to these, uh, these uh, webinar series, welcome back. If you're new to the series, welcome. The point of this, uh, these sessions is, isn't to teach you, you know, uh, theory and material for the exam. It's to try to go through question examples, go through some MCQ examples, trying to tackle, you know, common things that come up, tips and tricks, like I said, and um, hopefully to consolidate the learning that you have been doing for the exam. Okay, so we'll be going through some questions. There'll be a poll function for you guys to answer. Any questions, pop it on the Q&A and I'll try to get through them. If not, obviously you can, you guys can ask me anything you want at the end of the session as well. Okay. So why don't we get started then? Um, so we'll go, we'll go straight into it. So the first question, a 50 year old woman who is normally healthy and independently mobile presents to the emergency department complaining of severe hip pain. So it was after sustaining a mechanical fall. A plain radio, radiograph, sorry, of her pelvis reveals an undisplaced intracapsular fracture of the femoral neck. There are no signs of osteoarthritis visible. What is the best form of treatment for this patient's hip fracture? And the poll should be there now for you guys to answer. So look at the slide for the full stem because the poll um, is a shortened version of the question. Okay, I'll give you guys another 20 seconds or so on this question. About half of you have voted. Okay, why don't we end it there? Great. So um again looking at this question um it's quite wordy so it, it is good to just go through the question stem in detail but you have a 50 year old woman who's normally healthy and essentially has no com comorbidities they've had a fall and they've had a fractured neck of femur, which is a very very common presentation in orthopedics okay now in terms of answering this question, most of you or half of you that answered, which was the majority, went for A, cannulated screw fixation. And that would be correct. OK, so neck of femur fractures, regardless of whether they're undisplaced or displaced, will all have an operation. OK, now the primary goal for any operation that involves a neck of femur fracture or any hip fracture really is to get the patient back on their feet. Okay, that's why 
um, even in a 90 year old with a million comorbidities, it's quite likely they're going to have an operation. Um, and it's, it's, it's because the morbidity and mortality is essentially almost 100% if you don't have an operation um, within the first month or two months or so. Um, now, in this question, what we need to consider is patient factors, because I'll show you in a minute, um, there are pathways to consider when uh, knowing what type of operative approach you should be using. Okay, now, if it's undisplaced and intracapsular, remember, intracapsular fractures will be classified commonly on the gardens classification. Okay, now if it's undisplaced, you're going to be either gray in, in number one or two gardens classification. Okay, this patient's pretty young, they're healthy, no comorbidities, they're independently mobile, okay, and they've had an undisplaced intracapsular fracture. So where possible, you want to try to preserve the patient's own joint if it is in good health. And again, the question shows and says that they are, there are no features or signs of osteoarthritis on the radiograph. So her joint is probably in good health. And so you want to preserve that. And so you will try to do an internal fixation rather than an arthroplasty, okay, by removing and replacing the joint. So that's why A rather than B and C is a preferred option for this patient to try to let her own bone heal particularly given that it's undisplaced. Like I've said, all NOFs, all hip fractures go for an operation, so it's not D. And then E, an intramedullary nail is more appropriate for um, extracapsular fractures or intertrochanteric fractures, okay? But if it's an intracapsular fracture, then a nail wouldn't be suitable for that, okay? Now, this is just nice guidelines on the surgical procedures that um, you approach with a hip. Uh, and so obviously, like I said, <clears throat> you want to operate on patients to allow them to fully weight bear. Now, arthroplasties is generally when you have a displaced intracapsular fracture, okay? So in our, in our question, it's, it was an undisplaced intracapsular fracture, so it's gardens one or two. And so you're gonna to try to do internal fixation, which is done commonly by a cannulated screw. Now, when you come on to whether you do a hemiarthroplasty or a total hemiarthroplasty, I'm sure you're aware, it depends on, again, patient factors. Are they ambulant? Are they independent with their you know, aid activities of daily living? If they are, you give them a chance with a total hip. Whereas if they've got many, many comorbidities, um, they use a stick to get around, then the hemiarthroplasty is better tolerated. Okay. So on this pathway, obviously broad categories of ages. So if they're less than 65, you're going to try to internal fixate, use internal fixation with cannulator screws if possible. If that's not, you're going to go into a hemiarthroplasty. If they're over 65, check whether it's displaced or undisplaced. If it's displaced, it's likely going to be unstable and it's gonna be a gardens three or four. And following on from that, you're gonna do some form of arthroplasty. If they are ambulant and well, you're gonna to try to do a total hip. If they're not, you would probably try to do a hemiarthroplasty, okay? Now on this diagram, again, you can try to do cannulated screws potentially for intracapsular fractures as well. But for, for exam purposes, I would go along with the NICE guidelines and say arthroplasty for displaced hip fractures. And then depending on whether they're independent or not, go for a hemi or a total hip. Okay. So we'll go on to the next question and start the poll. Great. A five-year-old boy is brought to the emergency department after a severe fall onto his right knee. The child is in a lot of pain and the right knee appears swollen. A radiograph of his right knee reveals a fracture of the distal femur extending through the epiphysis, the feces, and the metaphysis. 
what type of epiphyseal injury has the child sustained according to the Salter Harris classification? Another wordy stem, go through it and answer in the polls. And again, don't worry about whether you know it or you don't. This is just a chance to try to, you know, drill questions, consolidate your learning. If it's things that you haven't come across, hopefully it will give you areas that you need to focus on as well. Okay, just over more than half of you have voted so far. I'll give you another 15 seconds for this question. Okay, let's let's stop it there for this one. So can be a tough one if you obviously can't remember the classification or and there are a lot of classifications, unfortunately, that you may you, you will have to familiarize yourself with the MRCS part A and clearly having to go through a lot of them will, you know, things can just merge and blur into one. So you may not um, remember exactly the steps within the questions, but most of you for this question, more than half of you who voted went for D, and that is the correct answer. Okay. Um, so in this question, it says that obviously the fracture extends from the epiphysis, the, fe the thesis itself, and then the metaphysis. And so obviously Salter Harris is the classification that we use for fractures that involve the um, growth plate. Now, this type of fracture isn't actually that common. You don't see a huge amount, um, but when it does, it you know you need to you need to carefully um, grade it and then uh, think about how you operate on it. But this patient with a fracture that goes from above the joint line through the uh, joint space, sorry, uh, through the joint growth plate, and then out the other end is a type four, and I'll show you a schematic in the next slide. Okay. So you've got obviously type one, which is through a fracture through the growth plate itself. Okay. Type two, it only comes above the growth plate. Type three comes across and below. And it's type four that goes all the way across the metaphysis, thesis, and the epiphysis, like so. And five is a crush type injury. Okay, so um, I mean, people have lots of different ways of remembering things. Some people like acronyms or, or you know, whatever it suits you. But um, Salter Harris. Um, it's it's a fairly straightforward one to know. So, um, you know, it's worth taking the time to just familiarize yourselves. And again, with all of these classifications, I would just jot them down somewhere, have a nice a couple of A4 slides or of a Word document or write, handwrite them out of the common classifications that you want to be remembering for the exam and then just study them and revise and um, remind yourself maybe you know, in the day or two before the actual exam itself. Okay, we'll move on to the next question. Okay, great. So we have a 30 year old lady who falls onto an outstretched left hand. She's taken to a local emergency department where she complains of severe pain in her left forearm. An AP and lateral radiograph of the affected forearm reveals a fracture of the proximal ulna with a disruption of the proximal radial ulna joint. Which of the following best describes this type of injury? So, a load of eponymous fractures, okay, which is described in this stem 
Let me give you a bit of time for this question. Okay, just over half of you have voted so far. I'll give you a little bit more time. Okay, five more seconds, guys. All right, let's stop it there. Tricky one. Um, a good a spread of answers, but the majority of you went for D, a Montegia fracture, and that would be the correct answer. So well done for those that who got that. And don't worry if you didn't. We'll, we'll go through uh, what each eponymous fracture is so that you know for the exam. Okay, so uh, this type of question, I think, especially for the, especially for forearm fractures, because there are lots of different types of eponymous names that come up. It's quite a popular question that comes up. Um, so for this one, the fracture pattern is the proximal part of your ulna as well as disruption of the radio ulna joint, obviously at the elbow. Okay, now this type of fracture is a Montegia fracture. Okay, and the Montegia, I'm sure you're when you're when you're studying, it comes hand in hand with Galeazzi fracture. Where so those two um, are almost the opposites of each other. Okay, and. A Montegia is proximal ulnar fracture with typically a dislocation of the radial head, essentially, and that's the disruption of that proximal radio ulnar joint. All right. Um, a Galeazzi, on the other hand, is a fracture of the distal radius. Okay, so the radius itself, um, and then disruption then of the distal radio ulnar joint. All right. So many people try to remember that with. Uh, just with that uh, new a mugger, all right. So mugger, M U, Montegia is a fracture of the ulna, whereas Galeazzi goes with R, and Galeazzi is a fracture of the distal radius. Okay. So um, I remember with mugger, it seemed to work quite well for me. So whenever there was a question, especially if there are two injuries, you've got a fracture on the radius or ulna, as well as a dislocation of the, either the distal radial ulna or the proximal radial ulna joint, you know it's going to be a Montegia or a Galeazzi. In terms of the other three that's um, listed in your answers there, they can't be correct because again, Barton's, uh, that just describes a fracture of the distal radius that also extends into your joint uh, between the radius and the carpal bones, okay? And then, Collies and Smiths, like Montegia and Galeazzi, Collies and Smiths are opposites of each other. Collies is your classic foosh of an elderly person who falls onto their arm, outstretched. You get that distal radial fracture as well as a dorsal angulation, and you get that almost dinner fork type uh, uh, malformation of the wrist. And then Smiths is just the opposite to that. So you get Vola angulation okay so worth remembering these um particularly montation and all um and galeazzi they see they came up it came up in my exam so uh just want to remember and mugger is quite a nice way of remembering it there's not much to it okay so let's move on to the next one we have a 45 year old man they're in a road traffic accident. 
brought into the a &E complaining of abdominal and back pain. They've got left flank and left upper quadrant tenderness on examination. He undergoes a CT of his abdomen. This shows a normal spleen, but a three centimeter renal laceration with a perinephric hematoma. How would you classify this injury? So we've got grades one to five. <clears throat> I'll give you another 30, 40 seconds for this. About a quarter of you guys have voted so far. Okay, we'll give it another 15 seconds or so. Third of you have voted. Okay, let's stop it then. So those of you who did vote went for C, grade three. And well done for those who did, because that would be the correct answer. Okay. It's another tough one. And um, in trauma, there are a few, <clears throat> like I mentioned, um, classifications or grading systems that you would want to be familiar with. Um, that's one for the spleen, one for renal injuries, and one for liver injuries in particular. Um, now, they're all slightly different, um, although they have some commonalities between them. So um, generally, grade, they are typically graded one to five. OK, five is generally a shattered organ. OK, completely shattered, um, devitalized. And will guarantee need some form of operation, which is likely just to um, excise that organ. Grade four is usually an injury or laceration to whatever hyla or vascular, neurovascular supply going to that organ, the main supply to that. For example, for the kidney, it will be for the renal hyla. Okay. Um, and then grades one to three, it depends then on the extent of laceration or hematoma and sizes of that. So let's just have a look at the kidney. So just to remind ourselves, sorry, from the stem, you've got normal sleeping, but you've got a three centimeter renal laceration, okay? And there's a hematoma around the kidney, but that's a three centimeter renal laceration. And just going on to this, this is a, a classification of renal injuries. So like I said, grade five shattered kidney, grade four, it's a laceration in through the corticomedullary junction, Okay, all the way through towards the hyla, okay, and into the collecting duct. Now, in your grades one to three, it depends on the size of hematoma or the size of laceration, okay? So for the kidneys, it's the key is to remember one centimeter, okay? So you've got essentially grade one, being essentially no laceration, then it's your, essentially, uh, <clears throat> you've just got a small contusion or um, minor, minor hematoma. Grade two is less than one centimeter, okay? So less than one centimeter in, in the size of your hematoma or laceration through the cortex of the kidney, okay? And then grade three is just more than one centimeter. So if you can remember one centimeter for the kidney, 
then that should be a fairly good ballpark of where you go. So anything above one centimeter, it's likely going to be grade three, unless in the stem it also says the laceration extends down to the collecting ducts or the renal hyla. Okay. So this one, three centimeters without any mention of injury to the vessels or the collecting ducts, then it's going to be grade three. All right. So let's move on to this question here. A 28 year old footballer is injured during a football match. They sustain a closed fracture of his left tibia and fibula. The nurses in A&E apply an above knee back slab. He requires a lot of analgesia. What's the next most appropriate step in managing this patient? Okay, give you guys another 15 seconds or so. All right, let's stop it there. It's, I think I, I, I think this is quite a tough question. Um, and most of you went for D, request a CT scan of the affected area. Um, the actual answer is A, guys. Uh, I don't think anybody went for it. And uh, especially, particularly when I was also um, preparing for the exam, I probably would have gone for D as well myself. Um, and we'll just go through the the different types of uh, answers and just try to justify why. But it's important to note here from the stem, it is quite subtle, but when you've got a fracture to the tibia and fibula, so fractures in your lower leg, obviously one of the complications that we need to think about is compartment syndrome. And he's requiring a lot of analgesia, which most people would if you've, uh, you know, had an injury to both your lower leg bones. Um, when somebody has been doing, you know, quite extensive cardiovascular work before the injury, um, because of that heavy blood flow going around the body, um, you should be a little bit more alert about the possibility of compartment syndrome, okay? And um, they've got an above knee black, black slab. We've got a diagnosis. And so this, this generally boils down to A and D really, okay? So D, in terms of ordering a CT scan, we need to just, you know, generally in orthopedics, you get a CT scan in two occasions where there's well sorry three you've got one if you've got diagnostic doubt so for example a 
a pelvic fracture or an x-ray of a pelvis that looked okay, but they're in a lot of pain and they're not mobilizing. So you want to get a CT for diagnosis. Two, for operative planning, but really the MRCS won't, and I think it'll be very, very harsh for them to test you on that part because, you know, that is, that, that, that's an FRCS level essentially. So CT for operative planning, I don't think we should be able to do that, um, you know, for many of the different types of orthopedic injuries you may get. And then three, the other, only other CT, and I think this is one for you guys to know, is a CT angio for, for example, if you have a knee, you know, a dislocation of the knee that goes posteriorly because then that you may have potential damage to the popliteal artery. Okay, so CT angio in that scenario, and I th I've seen it a couple of times that come up in past paper questions, didn't come up in my ex actual exam, but that's something to potentially take note of. But in regards to if you think about whether there's diagnostic doubt or not in an orthopedic setting, and here we know from the x-rays and pretty much all of your diagnoses will come from x-rays and orthopedics anyway. And so you're not, you don't necessarily do need to request that CT scan. Okay. And remember, this is the next most appropriate thing to do. All right. Um, now, for this patient, you don't want to be sending him home, regardless of what you might want to do, because there is a small, there is that chance of compartment syndrome. And also, potentially, if you've got unstable fractures, okay, generally speaking, you want to admit them for the potential chance of operating them early on a trauma list, okay? So for this question, you wanna be saying, admit and observe onto the ward, okay? I know it says nothing about specifics to compartment syndrome, but that's the most appropriate thing to do for this patient, okay? You don't want, as I said, you don't wanna be going, this man to be going home. So B and C isn't an option. And also given that this, the likelihood of a tibia and fibula fracture being unstable, is essentially going to be incredibly high. And so bringing them back to fracture clinic isn't actually that wise because they're just going to have to go through pre-op assessment to have an operation. It's better and better for the patient to just come in, be admitted, observe the leg, ensure swelling goes down with lots of ice and proper elevation that patients don't necessarily always do when they go home and then operate early on a trauma list. And then E, a range of operative intervention at the next available opportunity. It's quite vague and it can be, again, a little bit um, ambiguous, but the next available opportunity um, suggests that potentially, you know, you would be involved, but, you know, this patient's going to need to be discussed in a trauma meeting and then likely it's going to be the following day. Um, so A is the next uh, most appropriate next step, okay? Because A essentially comes after E, although E is technically correct too at some point. Okay, so I hope I hope the um, you know explanation of that was okay. Um, again, we can come back to it at the end if anyone had any uh, any questions about it, okay? So we'll go on to the next one. A biker is brought to the emergency department after being involved in a road traffic accident. Primary and secondary surveys reveal injuries only to his left leg. Examination of the left, uh, the, of the left leg, sorry, reveals a five centimeter laceration over the medial aspect of the leg with an associated comminuted fracture of the tibia. The wound is moderately contaminated, but without any obvious soft tissue loss. Neurovascular status is intact. How would you classify this on the Gustillo-Anderson classification? 
I'll give you another 20 seconds or so for this question. Another classification based question can be quite tough to recall. Okay, a few more seconds. Okay, let's end it there. All right, so we've got a split between B and C is the answers in this question. For this one, it will be C, um, it'd be three A, okay? So this guy has basically got an open injury. Uh, open fracture essentially okay and um castillo anderson classification is classificating um essentially open injuries okay open fracture sorry so type one is generally low energy trauma and it's less than one centimeter in length all right i'll go to the next slide because it's a better skin so type one is less than one centimeter and you've got minimal contamination type two is between one and 10 centimeters, okay? With moderate contamination and moderate comminution, okay? Type three, then you have greater than 10 centimeter in coverage, all right? So you've got type A, B, and C that are split down into A, having soft tissue damage around the open fracture that's greater than 10 centimeters with contamination. That's it. So essentially it's just an extension of two being greater than 10 centimeters. Type three B is essentially when you've got periosteal, a break in the periosteum as well coming out of the wound. So essentially you've got your bone which is broken and it's coming out of the wound. All right, so you may have a fracture line down there in type 3A, but it's still, the periosteum is largely still intact and you don't have lots of stripping that you get when you break it in a displaced manner. So type three is that periosteal stripping that this refers to, but otherwise it's again, more than 10 centimeters. And then 3C is when you get vascular damage too. All right. So that being obviously a surgical emergency. Okay, so um, yeah, that's essentially uh, your, you've got the classification for Gustio Anderson there, and that's something you want to be looking at. Okay, um, again, another classification system to just jot down the things and um, refer back to it close to the exam. That's how I that's how I did it, because it is quite tough to try to remember all of the different types of classifications in, in detail. OK, and um, so we've got this. Sorry, just going back to it here. You've got um, the five cent five centimeters across the medial aspect of his leg with comminutive fracture of the tibia. Um, the wound is contaminated, which obviously you're you're likely to get and neurovascular status is intact. Oh, sorry, sorry, my mistake. The answer, to, so um, B, this question should be type two. That was my mistake, sorry guys. So actually most two, it's which is good. B, okay. So we'll move on to the next question. All right, a five-year-old boy brought into A&E by his parents after falling off a carousel. Examination reveals an angulated right elbow and a cold distal right hand with no palpable brachial, radial, or ulnar pulses. APN lateral radiographs of the elbow reveal a displaced supracondylar fracture of the right humerus. Which of the following describes the most appropriate initial management? 
I'll give you another 15 to 20 seconds for this one. Almost half of you have voted so far. Okay, let's end it there. Great. So, um, overwhelming majority for C, manipulation of the fracture under GA. And that is the correct answer for this question. So again, these type of questions, these clinical questions, just always look at the last line carefully. Because um, depending on how they word it, it, it may change things. So the most appropriate initial management or the next step, for example, those are the things you need to just make sure in the stress or pressure of the exam, you don't miss because, you know, it answers in terms of definitive treatment or management versus the next step is very going to be often very different. So for this um, five-year-old boy who sustained a supracondylar uh, fracture of the humerus, which is um, most common in children. Okay, one of the things that can happen with supracondylar fracture is clearly a lot of them will be displaced, and generally the the displacement of the distal fragment goes backwards. And so what you can get is you can get essentially um, compression onto the neurovascular structures on there and. Um, it is slightly less common for a brachial artery to actually be uh, damaged or lacerated. Um, but what you could get is potentially is just um, compression onto the brachial artery. And so that's why prompt, well, any fracture really, prompt manipulation back to reduce it um, is always going to be appropriate. Okay, and so for this patient, if you reduce it, if you reduce the fracture and put it back into a good alignment, then often with children, because, you know, they're going to add um, factors of them being a child, the stress, the pain, etc., being done under GA is more common for kids. Um, so C is the correct answer for this patient. Clearly, um, Surgical exploration of the right antecubital fossa, that's just a bit more of an extreme measure. So before you do that, you would want to manipulate and try to reduce it first. And that's why that's it's the next initial management. If clearly you reduce it and they're still having no palpable pulses and they're cold distally, et cetera, you then, you know, you, you may want to do a surgical exploration. And D, an ORIF of the fracture is going to be a definitive management, but it's not the next initial step because there's work to do, okay? So we'll move on to the next question. A 28-year-old male involved in a high-speed uh, road traffic collision is brought to emergency department. He is noted to be bleeding from his nose. Closer inspection reveals bruising of the left mastoid process and bilateral periorbital hematomas. GCS is 12. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? Okay, we'll give you um, about 15 seconds. Okay, give it another five. Okay, great. All right, so yeah, um, all of you who voted essentially got the answer, basal skull fracture. So question um, a bit more on the more straightforward 
straightforward spectrum of questions and um, you will get plenty of questions like this so you know in terms of a selection of questions that we've put into some of the series that we've done quite often they'll be either tricky or things that may or may not be ambiguous in the exam but don't worry to, you know there will be lots of questions in there probably the vast majority anyway that you'll be you'll feel quite confident in um, particularly clinical questions that have very obvious um, trigger terms within it to essentially do essentially make a spot diagnosis really and this is that type of question so um yeah all of you got essentially basal skull fractures which is clearly um associated with trauma high trauma and you've got these panderized the bilateral periorbital hematomas all right as well as bruising of the left mastoid process okay so you've got um signs associated with a basal skull fracture Okay, moving on. 60 year old man is brought into a &E having suffered another road traffic co uh, collision accident. On arrival, he's tachycardic with a pulse rate of 130 beats per um, minute, blood pressure of 80 over 40 and a respiratory rate of 34. His urine output is five to 10 mils an hour there is an obvious deformity of his left femur with blood-soaked clothing. What is the most likely amount of blood loss? Okay, I'll give you another 15 seconds or so for this one. Just over a quarter of you have voted so far. Okay, let's stop it there for now. Great. So, a bit of a varied response for this one. Okay, so the correct answer would be D, um, 1,750 mils. Okay, now for this one, you need to essentially uh, be familiar with the classes of hemorrhagic shock. Okay, so this comes up a lot um it, it may answer it may test you guys in this type of format so it gives you some clinical features or signs and you need to match it into what grade it is or it will so ask you what grade or class of hemorrhagic shock they are in or it may ask about other parameters within that Okay, so you need to deduce it by knowing what class it is and then from that knowing for example, the estimated blood loss. Now, um, for this one, obviously, in terms of percentages, it's quite easy because you, you know, most people remember it as tennis scores. Okay, so zero to 15, 15 to 30, 30 to 40, and 40, above 40 for class four. Okay, in, in regards to the blood loss, then if you take the percentages, yeah, and then match it up into rough total blood volume in an average 70 kilogram man, then you can come to it. But, but or if you can just try to remember the figures within this table, um, some people are able to do that, all right? But this is definitely a table that you want to be getting familiar with. And a lot 
it seems anyway, a lot of questions, it comes down into class three. Okay, they'll be quite unwell. Um, for example, this patient here, they've got a low blood pressure. Yeah, it's decreased blood pressure, not normal, which would be class two, they've got decreased blood pressure. They've got a high respiratory rate and they've got a urine output, but it's reduced. And if they give you a urine output, that is really good because essentially the determining factor for class four for just from urine output is anuric, no urine out output whatsoever. Whereas class three, you'd have a reduced urine output. Okay. So if you've got lots of sick signs um, that the patient is really, really unwell, they've got a small urine output, then you know class three, not class four. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, anything between 1,500 and 2,000 mils of blood loss is class three. Okay. So um, get familiar with hemorrhagic shock. You know, the past test questions on kind of trauma are really good, actually. Um, and just go through them more, you know, a few times, actually, because there are trauma has a lot of different classifications that you should be familiar with so just drilling them through lots and lots of questions repetitiveness pattern recognition that will really help you out by doing those okay so let's move on to the next question so a patient presents to the emergency department following a severe burn to their right arm she's distressed and on examination has full thickness burns to the arm which of the following is not an indication to transfer a patient to the specialized burns unit? Okay, give you another 20 seconds or so for this one, guys. Okay, let's stop it there. Okay, so more than half of you voted for A, burns of 1% body surface area in children. And that would be correct, okay? So all the rest, you would want to be referring them to a specialized burns unit straight away. Okay, and so the criteria for transfer to burns unit, there are several, few, but the ones that, you guys should know essentially. So any full thickness burn should actually go to a specialized burns unit. So although A doesn't specify what type of burns it is, if it just says burns of a percentage, um, just take that as the fact that it's probably not going to be a full thickness burn, okay? Because any full thickness burn needs to go to a burns unit. All right. Now, in terms of percentages for children, it's more than 2%. Hence, why A isn't what the um, A is the answer here, and then for adults, it's more than three percent. All right, burns affecting hands, feet, or the perineum should go. Extremes of age as well. Okay, so you know severe burns in someone who's really elderly has huge high morbidity and mortality rates, so they need to be in a special ed burns unit, as well as clearly if you're if you've got a neonate um, or an infant who has burns um first of all you know they're gonna they could be critically unwell as well as the fact that you start then thinking of non-accidental injuries so they also need to be looked after in a specialized unit inhalational burns also need to be looked after in a specialized burns unit okay so this is just 
um, a rough guide. Um, feel free to take a picture if you like. Um, remember that these recordings and um, will be put onto the website at some point as well. Okay. But some of the things that we went through here, so burns, full thickness ones, circumferential ones, because they can um, become tight and restrict breathing, for example, if it's the thorax. So you may have to do an escarotomy. Um, persistingly non-healing burns. So lots and lots of different ones, actually. But um, the things that I would remember for this type of question is um, 2 and 3% affecting children and adults, okay? Extremes of age, hands, feet, perineum, and any circumferential, and that will cover a lot of it, okay? So, oh, sorry, I've just gone on to the wrong one, but we'll just go on to the next question now. Um, a 30-year-old man is brought in following burns to his anterior thigh. He is in lots of pain with blistering across the wound. The patient is resuscitated in the emergency department and is transferred to the burns unit. What is the most appropriate definitive management of this patient? Give you a little bit more time on this one. Okay, just under half of you have voted so far. Okay, I'll give you another 10 seconds. Okay, let's stop it there. So, um, a fair split between A and D here. Um, observe and monitor with antibiotics versus split thickness skin graft. So, um, for this type of question and for Burns questions, um, they do seem to like it. And also, just remember, I, it's not in within these questions, but remember just kind of the resuscitative fluids that you give um, in regards to Parkland's. Um, now they actually use more ATLS guidelines for burns. And so um, you go with, uh, in terms of the formula that they use anyway, you multiply by two rather than four. But in regards to this question, um, you've got the key bit here between A and D essentially is going to be because you could do both uh, potentially and, you know, it'd be especially with A, observing and monitoring with antibiotics is, could be a reasonable thing to do. But remember, it says what is the most appropriate definitive management of the patient? And so when it's definitive, it's more likely to be uh, something else other than observing. And if you've got burns to an anterior thigh, it's quite a big area. Um, if you remember the Wallace rules of nine as well, and the thigh is quite a big area to get a burn across. He's in lots of pain with blistering across the wound. So this is partial, this is, this is, it's not a full thickness burn, but it's likely to be a partial thickness burn. And that's unlikely to, you know, especially if it's that big of a coverage of an area, it's going to take quite a long time for it to heal. And so you may want to do something definitive rather than just observing with antibiotics, okay? And for this patient, you would want to do a split thickness skin graft, okay, um, to do so. Uh, 
All right. And we'll just, I just wanted to spend a little bit more time on this question. Um, just to go through some of the, sorry, what you said. Okay, great. Um, so for this question, I just want to talk a little bit more about the different types of grafts um, in regards to kind of plastic surgery, just because it's not something that's taught well at medical school. It's not something that's easy to pick up on. I, I don't think from some of the textbooks that you may have, for example, but um, for whatever reason, during my exam, I had at least six or seven questions that all related to kind of what type of graft is best for the patient, um, free flaps, rotational flaps, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't know why they just, maybe it was just that batch of question bank uh, that they used and they just included quite a lot of Burns questions and plastics based questions. Um, and I found it quite hard, obviously, at the time, but um, that's why I just wanted to, from my personal experiences, um, I think knowing the following would have been very, very helpful. Um, so we've gone through essentially Y, D over A, right, but then Y, D over B, C and E, essentially. And there are certain principles, if you know them and can understand them, you will you'll have a good chance of deducing the correct type of operative procedure that you want to do for a particular wound or essentially most, most likely in a trauma setting, an MRCS setting, it will be from a burns injury. Now, in terms of skin grafts, uh, you, well, let's first, you've got a reconstruction ladder, okay? So similar like, you know, like any ladders you have in medicine, like the pain ladder, you've got, you go up, um, Firstly, by heal, let things heal by secondary intention. So let it heal by granulation tissue from bottom up. You can suture it primarily closed. Then you've got things like vac dressing, so negative pressure. And then you go on to kind of the advanced stuff. So you've got grafts, generally grafts and then flaps. Okay. I would ignore things like tissue expansion and, you know, mat dermal mattresses, et cetera because that's way too advanced um, and I wouldn't be able to tell you much about it either. But in terms of a skin graft, okay, um, now when you, a skin graft that you take from a donor site, wherever donor site, it doesn't have a blood supply, okay? Um, and so its success depends on the, um, the the site that you are going to then graft it onto so it depends on the vascular rise bed that you are putting that graft onto okay now the main differences between a split skin graft and a full thickness skin graft is generally the coverage of area that you can use all right so we talked about the anterior thigh being a pretty big area all right um of of the body to try to cover with split skin thickness skin grafts okay you can shave off that top layer of skin not including the dermis all right and you can take a lot of it and so you can cover larger areas with it and also you can you can join it with a synthetic mesh, mesh as well to promote healing too so that's the major major if you can remember split skin thickness graft okay, comes with a big advantage of covering a large area. Um, that's something good to remember about that. Okay. Full thickness skin graft, on the other hand, you can't take a large amount of area for it. Okay, um, you're limited because it, you're taking the dermis as well, all right, you, you can't let that donor site heal without a primary closure all right so that limits the amount of tissue that you take from the donor site and so for, for example a thigh you would not be able to use a full thickness skin graft it's just far too large for it all right so in relation to our question in regards to a skin graft okay you could essentially a thigh 
the thigh is a common place that people take a donor split thickness skin graft from. So you could literally take the other leg, to harvest a very thin slice of that skin without the dermis, and then transplant it onto the burn itself on the alternate thigh. And then you would want to dress that other thigh and make sure it heals, which it will do. All right. Whereas you can't do that with a full thickness because you need an area that's small so you can close it with a suture. And then also clearly you want areas that have surplus of skin essentially, okay? So that might be, for example, um, areas like the post-auricular skin where you've got folds, the supraclavicular fossa is another site that you could take or the medial arm or groin, okay? But you can't take a large amount of it. Uh, and again, this is just uh, donor sites. So um, post-auricular skin, for example, these, these would be full thickness likely, whereas thigh and abdominal skin would be split skin graft because it's a large coverage of area. And then finally, just a small thing on flaps, although it's not relevant to this question, um, the key difference between a flap and a skin graft is that the flap carries its own blood supply with it, okay? And then obviously you can get lots of different flaps as well. You can get free flaps, rotation, you know, local flaps. But a flap will always bring with it its own blood supply. OK. And so the areas that you take a flap from is dependent on it, the blood supply to that particular area. So, for example, a, a deep inferior epigastric perforator flap which is commonly used in, for example, breast surgery, you take that and the, the, the bulk of tissue that you take to then transplant it onto another area, like for example, a breast to recreate, reconstruct that breast, you, the blood supply, it, you will transplant from the deep inferior epigastric artery and then you would want to anastomose it in, into the, into the um, from the donor site into where you want to attach it okay so free you know essentially free flaps can be taken from anywhere in the body and reattached to anywhere at the new new site okay but just remember that flaps bring with it its own blood supply okay um and that's it really so i think most likely because lots of questions based around trauma is you're going to use skin grafts if you know the skin graft principles, um, and it, this is just basic, you know, I, I, I haven't done a plastics job, um, I'm not interested in plastic surgery anyway, but um, if you can understand some of the core principles and just remember them, that will help just go th through your head in regards to justifying which ones um, you would need. So for example, clearly you can't primarily close a massive anterior thigh burn because there won't be skin edges to suture and it's a huge area and then uh, a free flap well you know a burn burns generally you, you're still going to have blood supply to the leg um even full thickness burns you don't need it will still have a blood supply um it would just take a lot longer to heal um and so or I think for how I approached it anyway, it came down to the area of coverage that you need to definitively manage. And so for this patient, if it's a thigh, it's quite a large area. So you're going to get this split skin graft. Okay. So yeah, that, that was just, um, just wanted to spend a bit more time on that because um, I don't think it's something that a lot of people generally are comfortable with uh, in regards to, as it's not a massively, well taught area at medical school and also for whatever reason in my exam it came up at about six or seven times okay you know clearly it may not be due for yours okay so um don't stress too much about it but um yeah just uh, take the time to remember those principles so we're coming on to our last question now a 45-year-old man presents to the uh, emergency department following a road traffic accident. His blood pressure is 96 over 45 and heart rate 124. On primary and secondary survey, 
there is evidence of pelvic deformity and blood at the urethral meatus. What is the most appropriate initial management of the patient? Okay, I'll give you another 15 seconds. We're getting there. Three quarters of you have voted so far. <clears throat> All right, let's stop it there. Okay, so, um, so we've got Answers spread across flu IV fluids, blood transfusion, pelvic binder, um, mainly there. So the answer to this question is C, pelvic binder. So well done to those who got that. And we can just talk a little bit about why that is in this scenario. So again, can be tricky, these ones, because it's not a straightforward one of you know, what's diagnosis, what's a spot diagnosis, for example, or what's the definitive management. It's asking for what's the most appropriate initial management of the patient. Okay, now clearly from reading this question, there isn't a huge amount of information, but the key is they've got pelvic deformity and blood at the urethral meatus. Okay, pelvic deformity from a road traffic accident is, you know, severe, severe, severe. Um, they need to be treated promptly and properly because you can bleed out from pelvic trauma um, because there are so many major vessels that run through. Now, this patient here, they're in shock and in a trauma-based setting, it's going to be a hemorrhagic shock until proven otherwise. With this with A and B, they're essentially serving the same purpose. B better than A, because if you've got evidence of blood loss, then, or suspicion of blood loss, like you do in this scenario, you want to replace blood with blood, all right? But it's it is very appropriate to do, because clearly when you're going through your ATLS, A2E management of the patient, you're going to get that IV access and you're going to give them initially fluids until you get your, your blood and then you're going to probably put up a, a major hemorrhage protocol to get your blood. But what's the most appropriate initial management of the patient? Well, within circulation of trauma, okay, if you go through it, yes, you're going to be taking your, um, you know, through a brief... Uh, cardiovascular exam, are they cool, peripheries, how's their pulse, what's their blood pressure, well we've got that here, they're in shock, have they got IV access, let's get IV access, let's take things out, so take all of your blood tests and whatever investigation is relevant that you want to do, then you want to start giving things, that's all appropriate, but also within C in a trauma setting, you need to look for possible sources of hemorrhage, as well as just doing your usual circulation assessment as you would do a normal A2E. And whenever you have things of blood, something causing blood loss, no matter how much you throw products at blood to maintain their volume, if you've still got blood loss, it's not going to solve the issue. So actually the most appropriate initial thing to do when you notice that there's pelvic deformity is to put a pelvic binder on because that's going to, the pelvic binder generally very tight band that goes across the greater level of the greater trochanters you put that on and then once you tighten it it's going to keep bring that whatever 
deformity, if it's a shearing force, whatever it is, it's going to bring that pelvis in and hopefully it's going to help to stop and compress any bleeding that is going on. That will give you a bit more time for them to eventually definitively go to theatres. Okay. And then clearly you're going to support them with IV fluids and blood transfusions. But this is why C is better because, you know, you could do A, B or C all, um, but C first thing because you need to stop that bleeding source. Okay. In terms of D, again, obviously they've got blood of the urethral meatus. You can get urethral injuries, bladder injuries from a pelvic fracture and that can cause blood of the urethral meatus. And yes, a it you know once the patient has been resuscitated, you will want to investigate that, and you could do an IV urogram, which would be very reasonable to do. Um, but obviously, that's going to be done by a urologist most likely. And then there are more pressing issues here. And um, for those of you who don't know, you know, uh, a urogram to try to diagnose in a trauma setting. Most commonly, you would inject, you can inject IV contrast or um, depending on, so yeah, you put contrast, x-ray, the film um, to see, or you inject essentially, you put in a normal Foley catheter, you put the tip into the, if it's a man, into the uh, urethral meatus, it's not all the way because you may damage trauma. So if there's urethral injuries, you don't want to catheterize them. But you just put the tip in and then you inject contrast up the urethra without actually catheterizing it via a Foley catheter. And then you x-ray that image to get your urogram picture to see where the disruption of flow, if there's extravasation of the contrast, et cetera, to find that level, okay? But in relevance to this question, it's a pelvic binder, okay? So that's the most appropriate initial. You would still do B and D, uh, A and B, and then definitive would probably be E, all right? So um, that's it for today. Um, I hope you found that useful. Obviously, trauma is a huge topic. And um, actually, you know, from going through the question banks of past test and past uh, EMRCS, in particular, the actual content of testing on trauma is really comprehensive. And I think if you do that in good detail, you'd be absolutely fine. Um, so the next session, guys, will be on Thursday. Um, I'm sure that it, Thursday is the 21st. It is, yeah. So we'll we'll look at the abdomen generally. So we'll try to cover GI and neurology stuff in that session. Um, this is the QR code. So if you could please take a couple of minutes of your time to just fill out a little bit more feedback. The feedback we've been getting has been really, really helpful and useful for us to, you know, uh, change little bits here and there. So. If you could do that, that would be really good before you go. Okay. Um, otherwise, enjoy your evenings. Um, I hope you've had a good bank holiday. And yeah, good luck with the rest of your prep. Hopefully we'll see you on Thursday for the next session. I don't think there are any other questions in the chat or Q&A. So um, yeah, if you guys could fill out the feedback and then you can... Uh, yeah, enjoy the rest of your evening.